Hello and welcome to NHP's webinar on safety essentials. My name is Daniel Nathanson. I'm the commercial engineer for NHP Electrical Engineering, specializing in automation and integration products and solutions. This is just one in a series of webinars created to showcase NHP's smart devices powered by smart distribution and embedding smart safety into operational processes, providing our customers with better visibility into processes, data, and analytics. This session is the first in a two-part series on machine safety essentials. In this session, we'll take a look at some of the fundamental concepts of safety of machinery. What are risks and hazards? How do we avoid them? And how do we protect against them? What are safety devices? And what about them makes them safe in the first place? We will also look at some of the terminologies used in the several machine safety standards. What are safety categories and performance level? And how do we determine what we design for? The most fundamental question is, what is the definition of safety in the context of machines? It is the freedom from unacceptable risk of physical injury or damage to the health of people. The key terms there are unacceptable risk, and we will discuss this in more detail soon. The systems put in place to provide safety are designed first and foremost to protect people and secondarily the environment. When we talk about machine safety, we're concerned about the safety of people around a machine, not necessarily the protection of the machine itself. Whilst a machine system should not be designed to damage the machine itself, it's important not to lose sight of people as a priority. I'm not willing to put a price tag on a machine in favour of a person's livelihood or life, and no one else should. Functional safety is another term which you may have come across. What this describes is a machine safety system which has a dedicated control system designed to monitor and control hazards of the machine. This could be something as simple as checking to see if a protective guard is opened or closed, or controlling the safe speed and position of a robot arm. These are all facets of functional safety. Okay, we need some safety around this machine, but how far do we actually go with this? Should I build a giant fence around the machine and never let anyone come in contact with it, ever? Sure, this will keep people safe, but won't exactly make it easy to use the machine. Do I keep buying more and more safety devices? Again, sure, but you must have deep pockets if that's the case. I already have some safety on my machine. Look at this beautiful emergency stop button. Great, but is it enough? As part of any machine life cycle, be it during design, commissioning, operation, etc., it's important that you perform a risk assessment to determine what you need to do and if it's enough. A risk assessment is meant to identify hazards associated with the machine, be it human interaction or a specific process. It should estimate how much risk is associated with that hazard, and then evaluate whether the risk is acceptable. There's always going to be some level of risk associated with everything we do, but it's important to determine whether this risk is significant and whether we should do something about it. A hazard can be anything associated with the machine that has the potential to cause harm. And the types of hazards you would look for will be different depending on what the machine does. Mechanical hazards could be crushing, cutting, or impact from a moving object. Electrical hazards like shock, or ultimately electrocution. Thermal hazards like burning or scalding, or even hazards associated with the materials handed by the machine. Is it infectious, poisonous, radioactive? How far do I go looking for hazards? It seems as if I could generate a list for the rest of my life. Yes, this is true, but as part of any good risk assessment, you care most about what is reasonably foreseeable. There is a hazard of me sitting at home watching TV and a plane engine comes crashing through the roof. Is it likely to happen? Probably not. Do I decide to relocate to an underground bunker to keep myself safe? I don't think so. This is not a reasonably foreseeable hazard. On a machine, do I have to concern myself with every piece of sheet steel covering falling off and injuring someone? If it's taped on with sticky tape? Probably yes. If I fasten it on using properly sized and dimensioned fastenings, then probably not. So we've identified hazards that are likely to cause a problem, but now we need to work out whether this hazard carries with it an unacceptable level of risk. This can be done as simply as looking at how people interact with the hazard. If someone is exposed, how bad is the injury going to be? A bruised hand or a lost hand? How often is someone going to be exposed to the hazard? Once a year for 15 minutes? Or are they standing in front of it continuously? And if someone was to find themselves in a hazardous situation, how likely are they to enact some, so some self-preservation and avoid it? Is it like the steamroller in Austin Powers moving along at half a metre per second? Or are we talking about a rapidly moving robot arm that if it's coming towards you, you'll never be able to duck in time to avoid getting hit? All of these factors contribute to whether there is a risk that's acceptable. Okay, so now we know what hazards are and how much risk they carry. We've identified some of the risks and we want to try and manage it better. We need to come up with a system 
functional safety system, if you will, which cancels out the unacceptable risk, and whatever is left is tolerable. Sure, I could build a top-of-the-line SIL-3 CAT4 PLE safety system, but am I going overboard? Is this enough? How much risk is left over, and what can I do to correct this? Well, if the risk remaining isn't tolerable, then you need to reduce it. There's a hierarchy of things that you can do to reduce risk that are more effective than others, and this, real, this really goes to show how early in the life of the machine should you be considering hazards and risks. The most obvious thing is also the most effective. Design your machine so that it doesn't have the risk. But most of the time we don't have that luxury as we aren't all OEM machine builders, or perhaps even the way the machine works, there's no way around certain risks being present. So you can put in place some fixed guarding. That will keep people out from the hazard, and we have solutions for, gen for general guarding from Axelon. But wait, people need to access some parts of this machine to keep it running, or to feed a product, or remove product. So we should perhaps make some of the guards removable, and, but we should at least monitor whether the guard is in place or not, so we can prevent our machine from doing something dangerous when the guard's off. And this is where we're most prominent in monitored access and interlocking. And so we've put all these guard measures, but there's still some level of risk there that we need to get rid of. We could instruct the people using the machine what to do and what not to do, but in some training programs, signage, etc. They don't do much, but there's something. And then lastly, we've exhausted all options, PPE, personal protective equipment. Wrap them up in chain mail and bubble wrap and hope for the best. Fortunately, there are standards available to help us with our safety system design. However, there are a few around which currently use in Australia and around the world. Which one you use depends on what you're most familiar with, the complexity of the design or application and where the machine will invariably end up. While some prefer one standard over another, all three, at the time of this presentation, are perfectly valid for use in Australia for machine safety applications. These standards can be categorized into two types, qualitative and quantitative. And this depends on the methods used to determine how a safety control system is designed in order to ensure an adequate level of risk reduction. They are comparable, but not equivalent, and we'll see why. The qualitative standard is the one based on safety categories, and there are five of them between category B and category 4. The standard we're talking about is ASNZS 4024 Part 1501 which until the last 10 years or so was the primary machine safety standard in Australia. It was recently reviewed and reconfirmed, meaning it's still perfectly valid for use. However, it is also running in parallel with some of the newer standards which we saw earlier. What makes this a qualitative standard is that it's based around the behavior of a safety control system and how it responds to faults. In other words, the quality of the safety control system. It doesn't address things like the probability of faults occurring or the time taken for them to occur. The categories are scaled from least effective to most effective in reducing the risk. Category B is the least effective and not often used, as it's mainly characterized by using standard components and zero fault tolerance, not necessarily designed for safety applications, but used with basic safety principles in mind. Whereas category four uses high levels of fault detection and fault tolerance using redundant components. The quantitative standards, on the other hand, consider not only the behavior of the system with respect to faults, but also consider calculated probabilities, which include the likelihood of a failure occurring, the failure being dangerous or safe, and the likelihood of detecting failures. The two standards which we use for machine safety in Australia are AS62061, which looks at SIL, or safety integrity level, and ASNZS4024 Part 1503, which looks at PL, or safety performance level. Both of these are based on calculations of the performance of the individual components in the safety control system and how they're arranged, and ultimately are a function of the probability of dangerous failure in any given hour. For example, PLE and SIL-3 are defined by the probability of a dangerous fault in any given hour of between 10 to the, ne 10 to the negative 8 and 10 to the negative 7. You could also look at this as the reciprocal, which is roughly the equivalent of one failure every 1,000 to 10,000 years. Considering the defined expected lifetime, lifetime of the machine is 20 years, you can see how effective a high integrity safety control system to PLE or SIL-3 can be. But do I have to use safety products to be safe? Well, the short answer is no, but this does not absolve you of the rest of your responsibilities to ensure that the safety control system is safe. And doing so with non-safety devices can be quite costly if you take into account the effort in design, development, testing, maintenance, etc.
the cost of the equipment might be cheaper, but using it for safety applications could easily blow out the budget and you lose any benefit you think you might have gotten away with. When we use devices specifically designed for safety applications, it makes the process significantly easier to design for, install and even integrate into an existing system. But when we're talking about safety control system, what about it makes it safer than any other control system? What makes a safety control system safe? Three Ds, duality, diversity, and diagnostics. Duality or redundancy ensures that we have some failover in our system so that if a fault occurs somewhere in our safety control system, it can still operate effectively and bring the machine to a safe state. This is typically realized as multiple devices operating in parallel or in series. Diversity, ensures that we have multiple devices operating in a redundant system, that a single fault doesn't knock out the entire safety system. For example, I've got two switches from the same batch, from the same manufacturer, which have an anomaly where they fail dangerously when exposed to a high voltage spike. They could fail at the exact same time if I get a power surge. Whereas if I have two sensors from different manufacturers or even different types, maybe one is electromechanical and the other one is solid state, the likelihood of the same fault damaging both in the same way at the same time is reduced. And diagnostics. If a fault does eventually occur, we should be able to detect it, bring the machine to a safe state, and then prevent it from restarting until the fault is corrected. Let's have a look at an example of a safety control system. We're using standard components in this case, but in a manner which would be used in a safety control system. I should preface this with a caveat though. This is not necessarily a complete safety control system. Uh, it's only shown for the sake of an example. On the left, we have two sensors, which are monitoring a single guard. They're each fed into a logic controller, an SLC at the top and a PLC5 at the bottom. That's how old these are. And we have two contactors controlling power to a motor. This example shows at least one example each of duality, diversity, and diagnostics. Can you see them? For duality, we have two switches running in parallel, two logic controllers, and two contactors. A single failure in any one of these components does not result in us losing the entire system. There's always a backup device to perform the same function of the other. For diversity, we're shown using two different types of logic controllers. These are each performing the same function, but are from completely different series. So a fault inherent in the design of one does not necessarily exist in the other. And so the likelihood of both of them failing dangerously in the same way at the same time is greatly reduced. And for diagnostics, we have two PLCs interacting with each other, ensuring that the inputs from the limit switches are detected by the other PLC and that the logical output is the same. They also check to make sure the health of the other PLC is intact, and if a fault is detected in either, the healthy PLC will bring the system to a safe state. But what about inside a safety PLC? This is a very basic overview of what's happening inside a PLC on the hardware side, not necessarily looking at the programming software or standard and safety program segregation, so we have to use our imaginations and abstract thought for a bit. Where might we see each of the 3Ds? Duality exists in having multiple components inside the PLC to perform the same task. We have two microprocessors and two sets of memory, flash and RAM. If we have a failure on one of the memory registers in the RAM, for example, then the other can still perform the same task. Diversity. This isn't obviously represented, but in each of the redundant components, we might see chipsets used from different batches or different manufacturers. For example, the microprocessors might be from different manufacturers. You might also find multiple methods of how the program is executed. And in diagnostics, this is rampant inside safety PLCs as they spend most of their time doing self-checks. We have a system of synchronization. This ensures that all redundant components operate at the same time or wait until both component sets run through their respective cycle before moving on to the next. And we also have a watchdog comparator. This checks the input and output of each cycle and ensures that they're identical before moving to the next. If it sees any difference, it knows that something has failed or is about to fail and can enact the correct measures to bring the system to a safe state. And if we take a closer look at a typical safety control system using actual safety devices, we can see examples of each of the 3Ds again. In this example, we have a tongue interlock and a non-contact interlock switch monitoring a guard, which are fed into a safety monitoring relay, which in turn controls a pair of safety contactors. For duality, we have two switches on the guard. If one fails, then the second can still detect the state of the guard. In the safety monitoring relay, where there are multiple levels of redundancy, including redundant chipsets, relays, and contacts, and we also have two contactors, which we also saw in the first example. 
Also note that each of the interlock switches, there are two normally closed contacts in each, so two circuits or channels. Diversity. The two interlock switches are of a different type. One is contact and the other is non-contact. Inside the safety monitoring relay, there may also be redundancies in the chipsets as we saw earlier in a safety PLC. And for diagnostics, the safety monitoring relay is constantly checking each of the circuits coming from the interlock switches, ensuring that any wiring faults are detected, and also that both sets of switches operate simultaneously or close to it. It performs its own self-diagnostics and also takes a pair of feedback contacts from the contactors to ensure that they operate correctly when they're supposed to. So I've mentioned the idea of safety devices or components, but what in particular about them makes them suitable for use in safety control systems, or how might some of their features be used? These are a few examples, but by no means an exhaustive list. Direct-driven contacts operate by what's called direct mechanical action. This means that the operation of the contacts is directly coupled to firm mechanical motion, not by, say, something like springs or electrically actuated. What this means for, say, a limit switch, is that when you press on the actuator, the sheer force of pushing the actuator directly opens the contacts. So if, for example, the contacts were stuck closed, the force from the actuator is enough to forcibly break them open. This makes them significantly more reliable. Mechanically linked contacts are used in electromechanical switching devices like contactors and relays. This means that all of the contacts, both the main poles and auxiliaries, are solidly linked together. This ensures that if any one of these contacts is stuck in the incorrect state, again, possibly because of a well or a similar failure, then all other contacts must also be in the same state. As we saw in some of the examples earlier, we can use one of these auxiliary contacts to provide feedback to the safety control system to reliably tell whether a contact or relay has failed open or closed. Some safety components will have multiple redundant contacts linked together in parallel or series. This is to ensure that if one contact fails, then the other can still perform the safety task. Safety devices are designed so that when they fail, they also fail to a safe state. This is called failure mode orientation. And also overdimensioning or overdesign of safety components. For example, if you're using a component to switch four amps, you would select one which can switch eight amps. This feature further reduces the risk of failure. In machine safety applications, the typical fail safe state is to simply turn the machine off by removing power from all outputs. This could be done when a product or device has detected a fault and then defaults to simply de-energizing everything. We can see that this is a failure mode orientation for most safety products. However, this is not always the case. The failure mode orientation of a device always needs to be considered to make sure that if it's make sure that it is suitable for the risk of its reducing. You can't have a device turn off and produce an even more hazardous situation. We call this high availability where if everything were to just shut off, we could end up in an even more dangerous situation. This is particularly prevalent in the process industry. Take, for example, a pressurized vessel of some product where the pressure is being carefully controlled by an electronic valve. If we allow the entire system to turn off because of a detected fault in the safety control system, this pressure valve is no longer energized. The pressure could build up to dangerous levels and rupture the vessel, possibly causing an explosion. So instead of shutting everything down, a safe state could be to continue to run the process for some time whilst the replacement component is sourced, or it could instead perform a controlled shutdown, where the processes are carefully brought down to safe levels before shutting down. Whilst we find this most in process safety, machine safety still requires careful consideration of exactly what happens when that e-stop button is pressed. Simply dropping power immediately might not be the best thing to do in an emergency. By now we should know that we need to have a safety control system in place. We've identified that there might be a hazard with a section of the machine. We don't know exactly what measures we need to put in place because we still need to evaluate how much risk is associated with this hazard and how much of this risk we need to reduce. As part of our risk assessment, we should work out what category or performance level or SIL we need to design our safety control system to before we start procuring devices and running wiring. This example I'll be going through is one of the processes used to work out the required safety category needed for a given hazard. This is the informative process used in AS4024 Part 1501, which is the safety category standard. Recall that the level of risk is a function of the severity of injury, the frequency of exposure, and the possibility of avoiding harm, and we can run through each of them to get to the desired outcome. Let's look at this example of a chain and sprocket. We start at the left side of the chart and we move to the right. When we get to a junction, we have to make a decision which chooses our next path. So, starting from the left and moving right, we approach a junction for S, which is the severity of injury. We need to decide, is the injury slight, S1, or serious, S2? 
Suppose the sprocket teeth are large and probably sharp enough that they could easily take your finger off if you find yourself sticking it in there for whatever reason. Is this a slight or severe injury? Now, some might argue that the dismemberment of a finger is slight because you could always reattach it. I argue this group of people should lop their own finger off and tell me if it's slight or serious. A bruise or scratch or something requiring the first aid kit could only be considered slight. Anything that requires calling the ambulance or a trip to the emergency room, that should reasonably constitute an S2 or serious on this chart. So, removal of a finger? S2 it is. We move along to the next junction, which is F, frequency of exposure. How often is someone going to be standing in front of this chain sprocket drive? The more exposure they have to it, statistically speaking, the more likely they are to be injured by it. So what do we consider seldom or frequent in this context? If they need to lubricate the chain maybe once every six months and it takes them 30 seconds each time, that's seldom, F1. But if they need to lubricate the chain maybe once per shift, 280 days per year, and the lubricant they use probably isn't the best, but it's the cheapest, that's more frequent, possibly F2. In this case, let's consider F2 because they need to maintain the chain once per shift because they believe it to be more cost effective this way. F2. We move along to the next junction. We can already see that we're getting closer towards the higher safety categories. This is probably going to get expensive. Now we need to consider the possibility of avoiding harm. If they find their fingers are probably getting a bit too close to the sprocket teeth, how likely is self-preservation going to kick in quick enough to get them out of the way in time? P1 is definitely possible. The chain and sprocket maybe don't move that quickly, so finding yourself in harm's way is not likely. We choose P1 and end up here. The large black circle indicates that we must use, at minimum, a Category 3 safety control system. We could use a Category 4, but we cannot use a Category 1 or 2. So maybe we should take another look at the risk assessment around their machine. Maybe there's something else we can do to help mitigate some of the risk that would land us with a simpler safety system. Perhaps we could reduce the frequency of exposure to the chain and sprocket. We noted that with F2, we needed to lubricate the chain once per shift. If we change the way in which we perform this lubrication maintenance to maybe something that uses an oil pump to automate some of it, or use a better quality lubricant that requires less frequent application, we can reduce the frequency of exposure to something minimal that will allow us to call it an F1. This changes our path, and now we end up with a safety system designed to category 1 or 2. Note how both of these categories are highlighted as being permissible. There are some differences between the two categories, but I would probably suggest in this instance to design a Category 1 system, which is significantly easier and cheaper than Category 3, which we had earlier. We might even find that the improvements made to the lubrication process is more cost effective than the originally proposed safety system, and would still ensure the safety of personnel around the machine. Let's look at the same application, but this time using the performance level standard, AS4024 Part 1503. The process is the same, we start from the left and move to the right until we get to a junction. However, the main difference with this process, aside from having performance levels instead of categories, is that we still consider the risk associated with an S1 severity. In the categories process, an S1 went straight to category 1, whereas now we still consider F and P, even for slight injury. A slight injury can still be high risk or low risk, and we would rather have a low risk associated with a slight injury than a high one. So we start again with the same example as the previous slide, with the, with the original lubrication system with high exposure. So, S2 for injury, F2 for frequency, and P1 for possibility of avoidance. We land at performance level D. Notice that you can still end up at D by other means. For example, if you have F1 frequency, but P2, or low possibility of avoidance. But now we make the same change to the lubrication system we had earlier, which changes F2 to F1. We now end up with a lower performance level of C. This is not as drastic a reduction in the performance of the safety system as before, but we still see how changes to our machine or process can affect the measures we take in designing our safety control system. Now recall that performance level was based on the probability of dangerous failure in any given hour but we still need to have some idea of what our safety control system should look like before we start doing the calculations. After all, we need to know the details of the products in order to include them in the calculations. There is a simplified process in the standards that we can use to help narrow down the architecture of our safety control system. This chart looks at three different factors and how they relate to the performance level, and they are categories. Yes, performance levels are based on categories, but they also require consideration of the amount of fault diagnostics and the likelihood of failure, which are the other two factors. DC, or diagnostic coverage, 
This is a percentage of dangerous faults which are detected by the safety control system. And MTTFD, mean time to dangerous failure. This is given in years. So let's use the chart. We decided on a performance level C control system in the last example because we made some changes to our lubrication system to reduce the frequency of exposure to the hazard. Looking at the vertical axis, we can see a region on the chart which corresponds to a performance level C. And there are five regions that we can consider. On the horizontal axis, we have a combination of categories and diagnostic coverage. If we consider performance level C, we have a few options. Category one with no diagnostic coverage at all. So we don't detect any faults. Category two with low diagnostic coverage. So we detect less than 60% of dangerous faults. Category two with medium diagnostic coverage. That's between 60 and 90% detected. And also we have a category three with low diagnostics and medium diagnostics. The colored boxes also indicate the mean time to dangerous failure, which we require. If we choose the first option with category one and no diagnostics, this box is red. So we must have a high mean time to failure, at least 30 years. Whereas if we choose a category three system with low diagnostics, we can get away with a medium mean time to failure of between 10 and 30 years. We can even go with a medium diagnostic, which allows us to have a low mean time to failure of between three and 10 years. So our options are fairly broad. This does actually marry up closely with what we had when we used the risk evaluation chart for categories. When we lowered the frequency of exposure, we had the option of category one or two, and we have the same here for PLC. We, when we had the original frequency, we had to use category three or performance level D. You can see though, with the performance levels, we have a bit more freedom of movement in our design for PLD, as we can use a category two or three architecture, depending on how much DC and MTTFD we have. But let's look a bit closer at categories. We've spoken a lot about them, but what do they mean specifically? A safety category is defined by its requirement and system behavior. That is, what are the main features of a safety category and what happens when a fault occurs, which makes them different. Let's look at category B first. This is the category which gives us the lowest level of risk reduction. It requires that the safety related parts of the control system are designed and constructed in accordance with the relevant safety standards and can withstand the expected influence. This just means that you can use anything provided it's suitable for the physical task. Make sure the current ratings are okay and that it's suitable for the environment, temperature, ingress, etc. Standard products. But the occurrence of a fault can still lead to the loss of the safety function. Well, this makes sense though, because a category B shouldn't give us that much of a risk reduction. It's only for very low risk applications. If it fails, who cares? The worst that will happen is only a slight injury. Category one, the risk of B, sorry, the requirements of B shall apply. So make sure the device is suitable for the task and the environment, but it also requires that you use well-tried components and well-tried safety principle. Use a safety interlock switch, use a safety contactor, products which are well-designed and specifically designed for use in safety applications. It also uses well-tried safety principles like over-dimensioning of contacts, direct-driven contacts, etc. But looking at the behavior, a single fault can still lead to the loss of the safety function. It has the same behavior as B, but the likelihood of a fault occurring is significantly less because we're using well-tried components. They're less likely to fail in the first place. So even if a single fault could still occur and lose the safety function, it is much less likely to happen in the first place. In category two, it's not used very often as it's generally harder to design for. It still uses standard devices and the requirements of B, and well-tried safety principles, but not well-tried components. Instead, it requires that the safety function is checked at suitable intervals by the machine control system. It requires some diagnostics to ensure that the components used are working correctly. But looking at the behavior, if a fault occurs, we still lose the safety function. The only difference here is that we were able to detect the fault. So we have the opportunity to correct it before the next operation. This does reduce the risk, but you can see how it might not be as effective in some situations. But still, category two is still for low risk applications. Moving along, we're now starting to move into more complex territory. Categories three and four are for high risk applications and as such have a few more requirements when it comes to diagnostics, but they also introduce a layer of fault tolerance. Category three, same requirements of B with well-tried safety principles, but also a single fault in any part of the safety control system does not lead to a loss of the safety function. And whenever reasonably practicable, the single fault is detected. So we can do this using redundant components, two contactors, two contacts on our interlock switch, and a safety monitoring relay to detect the faults when they occur. 
If we get a single fault, then we can still perform a safety function, and we should be aiming to detect these single faults. But if we get two or more faults, we could still lose our safety function. So category four takes over. The difference here is that a single fault is detected at or before the next demand on the safety function, or if this is not possible, then an accumulation of faults does not lead to the loss of the safety function. In the former case, the level and frequency of diagnostics done on the safety control system is quite high. So if a fault happens, we should be detecting it early enough that it doesn't pose a threat. But if we can't do this for any reason, then we should ensure that we get two or more faults so we don't lose the safety function. Typically, an accumulation is considered to be two or three faults. Let's see what happens with a typical safety control system for the various categories. Here we have a category one system, which has a safety interlock switch, that is a well-tried component, monitoring a guard. It's a single normally closed contact in a normal DOL stop-start circuit, controlling a contactor, which drives the motor of a saw blade. When we open the guard, the interlock switch opens and the motor stops, as you'd expect. But let's see what happens when a single fault occurs. In this case, there's a problem with the interlock switch and the actuator mechanism has been damaged. When we open the guard, the contact does not open and the motor continues to run. We now have a situation where a single fault has left us with a loss in the safety function and are exposed to the hazard. This is what happens in a category one. But remember, this is for low risk applications. Exposure to the hazard is not necessarily going to leave us open to high risk of injury. In a category two system, we have the second interlock switch on the guard, S2 and a PLC which is doing some monitoring of the guard and the contactor. If a fault occurs on S1 like we had in the previous example, we still lose the safety function and the motor is still energized when the guard is open. However, the PLC has detected that the guard has opened and the contactor is still energized, so it alerts us that a fault has occurred, so we have the opportunity to correct it. Category three. This time we have the same two switches, except both are now wired in series and being monitored by a safety controller. This could be a safety monitoring relay or a safety PLC. We also have two safety contactors driving the motor and a pair of mechanically linked feedback auxiliaries for fault monitoring. The same fault occurs with S1. However, look what happens when we open the guard. The motor stops. That's because in a category three system, a single fault does not lead to the loss of the safety function. In this case, however, because the two switches S1 and S2 are wired together in series and both contacts of S1 open as expected, the safety controller does not detect the fault with S1 because it cannot differentiate between them. It only sees the, it only sees the circuit open up. This is one of the behaviors of category three where some, but not all faults will be detected. But in category four, we can see that S1 and S2 are wired into the safety controller using separate input pairs. Now, when the guard is opened with the same fault on S1, we still de-energize the motor as required. A single fault does not lead to the loss of safety, but now the safety controller is able to detect that both switches did not open up at the same time. It has detected on the demand of the safety function that a fault has occurred and will prevent restart of the system until this fault is corrected. By now, you should have a better understanding on what safety control system is. In particular, what safety categories and performance level are all about and how we use them to make our machine safer. This was part one of our Safety Essentials series. Please join me in the next session, part two, where we take a closer look at some of the safety products available from NHP and some examples on their application in safety control systems. See you next time.